My name is Vlad, and so I'm coming from Share Foundation, Share Lab. So basically, it started, I think, maybe like five years ago, before we were organizing some events, like mostly for internet activists, and it was mostly like parties and and a lot of interesting talks and tra la la. -la. But then we realized, you know, like it's in the moment when something is happening, in, mostly in Serbia, we didn't have any kind of capacity to, to basically like do anything. So we said, okay, let's do something more serious than just to organize events and parties and stuff like this. And then we started to develop this share foundation. And then we had like a lot of different groups of people involved, like mostly lawyers, and, uh, but also like cyber forensics and, and media theorists and artists and so on and so on. And then first, we, when we started to do, like, we were thinking that it's going to be like easy job, you know, like more like, you know, academic, going around and speaking at some events and tra -la -la. But basically, from the first moment, we had a lot of job because in Serbia, in, in that moment, started like a lot, a lot of cyber attacks on different uh, 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 investigative journalists and, 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 uh, and online independent media and so on, so on. So we were like, all the time in, in, in basically in situation to, to help other people to try to understand what, what is happening to them. So we were giving them cyber forensic support. So for example, some website is being attacked, for example, DDoS attack, and then our cyber forensic guy is going there, trying to understand what's happening. Then I, our lawyers are trying to explain in some legal way how to sue someone or like, do some kind of counter reaction on that. And, and then slowly we, we, we had like another stream of, of, of events going on. So we were like interested in like trying to, because we were getting more and more data about like things that is happening around us in, in this kind of digital space. So we, we started to, to visualize this kind of data. And it, mostly we, we were like, uh, you know, interested in, in like visualizing invisible infrastructure. So, or, or, or basically all of those things that we don't see and they are behind our screens, you know, because behind those interfaces. So we first started by analyzing different internet service providers. For example, this is one internet service provider. And it was like, wow, nice, you know, like it's beautiful and so on and so on. But then we realized in, in some moments that we can use those maps to read them, not just on the level of aesthetics and a level of like, wow, how this is nice, but on the level of where, for example, like some kind of uh, uh, spying equipment will be potentially uh, installed or where, the, where are the points if government want to start, like for example, to, to do filtering of internet where it will happen. And then we were going like more deeper and deeper into understanding those networks. And then we realized, okay, it's not just about how those networks looks like, but it's also like what kind of type of code it's, it's running on, on different places. So this is, for example, one part of the visualization of uh, trackers. So on the left side, you have like list of websites that we are analyzing. In the middle, we have different trackers. On the right side, you have a companies that basically are the owners and collecting information about our visit through those trackers. And then by analyzing that, we were going more deeper into, into issues of, of surveillance capitalism, as we like to say, because we realized that, that, that for example, like 90% of the website that we analyzed had the Google cookies or like almost 50% had Facebook cookies. So even if you are not using those platforms, I don't know how not to use Google, for example, but Google in 90% of, of cases have a information about your online movement. So in Serbia, there is one really great guy. His name is uh, Rodoljub Šabić. So he's the commissioner for privacy for like, and so we threat, we threatening him that we are going to sue him if he don't give us some information. And then he gave us like 2,000 pages about like how <laughs> from like different uh, communication between him and, and uh, telecom providers and government agencies. So we made few different maps that were like 
trying to, to show us how the process of data retention uh, works. And this is like part of one map. In that moment, I realized that, that this is going like really in direction because I really started to enjoy in doing that. And it started to feel like being some kind of detective. But one of the best detective cases we had it was like uh, trying to, to, to follow one group, Italian group called Hacking Team. So we were analyzing their uh, metadata from their emails. And then we were basically trying to perform the same situation, same methodology that NSA is using for like following us. We were trying to do the same to the people from, from Hacking Team. And this is one of those things. For example, this is the emails from director. And then we were trying to spot different anomalies and trying to do different funny things around this. This is like, for example, one visualization of uh, our like uh, uh, troll hunting operation. So we were trying to understand how different uh, bots, this kind of government from this SNS, this is like ruling regime party in Serbia. So they have like army of, of, of trolls uh, doing different things on, on, on like uh, Serbian online media. And then basically we were trying to spot them. And those like uh, bigger dots are some kind of anomalies in, in this universe of con comments in Serbia. But then all of this led to, to one big research. And this is like the map on the left side. And I hope after this talk that it will not be probably too long. Uh, I really encourage you to, to try to see the maps that we printed, because usually we are publishing all of this on our website, and it's a different experience. When you see this on the big scale, it's kind of like different feeling. So this is the reason why we are here. So, so this is the map that I, will speaking, that, that I will speak about now. And this is like our research about uh, Facebook algorithms. So all of those, like, uh, investigations about like this surveillance capitalism led us to, to this one because this is like the golden cow of the surveillance capitalism, Facebook. You know? And there was like a lot of story in the last two, three years about, about something that it's called uh, algorithmic transparency. <coughs> algorithmic transparency, it's, it's like idea that we can maybe try to understand what's going on inside of these big black boxes. Uh, and try to understand how different algorithms are, are influencing uh, uh, our lives. So we said, OK, let's try to do that. But it's not easy. I will explain you why. But first, let's see some facts. OK, this is almost a fact. It's a fact from two years ago. So there is 1.6 act billion active users of Facebook. Now it's wow. around 2 billion. So, and if we compare this with some, for example, countries, so China have 1.3 billion, India have 1.2, United States have 300, around 300 million people, that's five times smaller than Facebook. And Serbia have 7.1, that's 223 times smaller than Facebook. I don't know, Slovenia, it's <laughs> also a similar range, no? So a lot of people. And there is 1 billion logins into Facebook every day, 300 petabytes of user data, 1.1 trillion likes since 2004, 4.5 billion likes every day, 3.1 million likes per minute, 17 billion location text posts every day, 350 million uploaded photos every day, 4.7 billion items shared each day, 10 billion messages sent each day. This is on one side. This is what, what they are collecting in a way. And then on the other side, you have 17.9 billion, almost 18 billion of revenue in one year for Facebook. So somehow all of these big numbers is transformed into this 18 billion dollars each year. Those black boxes, especially this one, define new forms of labor, exploitation, and generation of enormous amount of wealth and power for the owners of this invisible immaterial factory, creating deep economic gap between ones who own and control the means of production and their users who are all, uh, really often live below the poverty line. So now trying to, 
to put this into some kind of frame of, of, of labor. And beginning of 2000, there were like really popular media theory angle of trying to, to, to speak about immaterial labor. So idea about immaterial labor is that when we are doing something on those platforms, when we are commenting, when we are liking something, when we are like writing blogs or whatever, we are basically performing immaterial work. Okay. And in this case of Facebook, we are, people are averagely spending like 20 minutes per day using Facebook. I think it's more, but let's yeah. say 20 minutes per day. <laughs> so, and if it's 20 minutes, this is 300 million of free working hours per day that we as a users are giving to them. And then we were trying to understand Facebook as a company from a lot of different angles. So for example, in this one, we scrape all the LinkedIn accounts of the, of the, the board members. And then we were trying to connect, to make some connection between them, for example, based on the other companies they have, or based on, on uh, um, uh, school they study, or, or different ways. And this is like methodology that's used long time before. This is something that looked like I don't know, uh, they rule, that I really like uh, from Josh on. And, and, but we, this was not giving us an answer on how this system really looked like. This is some kind of human layer of, of, of this factory. And what we saw there, it's maybe that, that different people, for example, you have, I don't know, Peter Thiel on one side and Mark Andersen, and then Peter Thiel, he liked to own, to spend a lot of money, but really little amounts to, to invest in startups, this other guy. So by that, he's kind of the king of this like uh, startup environment. And then another side, you have another guy, Mark Anderson. He owns like all uh, shares in all these big companies. So kind of different, different field as well. Then the other board member, it's for example from academia, the other one it's political, and then basically through their board, they're trying to put their feet on, on a lot of different grounds, you know. And then we were trying to understand how, for example, the, the workers that are working in, all the people that claim to work at Facebook through their LinkedIn accounts, where they are coming from, where they, they study. So we try to understand how this human segment of Facebook looked like, but we also didn't learn a lot through, through this, except that, okay, in some way, on the level of programmers, or basically people who are working there in this factory, it's kind of de democratized because they are coming from a lot of places in the world, and not just the big, big like, uh, universities or, or companies. But then more you are going up, you are seeing that, 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 that it's just like, almost just like Ivy League, players, you know, but also interesting thing under over one level of this, you understand that in order to go to, to this position, you need to work before in other big company like Microsoft or, 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 or other. So it's a one kind of bourgeoisie that is kind of separated from our reality. <clears throat> but the real, uh, answer to, to how this machine is working, it's, it's under. It's basically in, in those algorithms and, and in technical infrastructure. And this is something that you will be able to hear, to see here. So on the left side of, of the map, is basically all, all the inputs into this factory. On the right side of the map, it's how they are selling us as a product. So here, you have like actions and behaviors. This is all the things that you do. So what we try to, to do, we try to map all the different interactions that you can have with Facebook. So you can like, share, search, view, post, check in, post links, whatever. Create page, lots of different things. Then the second part is something that's called profile uh, uh, profile information, and the difference between profile information and uh, actions and behavior is that even Facebook is saying we don't care so much about profile information because uh, this is what you think about yourself, and it can be lie. 
You can be Yanis Yansha, one, two, three, or four. You can be different things. But between two, two or three Yanis Yansha, even they call themselves Yanis Yansha and they claim that they have, for example, the same uh, background or whatever, what will make a difference between them is their actions and behavior. And this is what separates different users. No? So they say, we don't care about profile information because you can lie, you can pretend that you're something. But what we really care is how you behave and what you do. Okay? But still in profile information, you can find a lot of interesting things. And the third big, big segment of this, it's a, something that we like to call digital footprint. And it's mostly what your devices are saying about you. So they are able to, connect, to collect a lot of information from your devices. So for example, those are all the different types of data that they are able to connect through these four different applications. So Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, and Messenger. And basically, they have access to most type of data that exists in your phone through those applications. And all of those different types of data are becoming resource for this kind of algorithmic work that will happen after. And some of them are, 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 can be considered as, as uh, sensitive, or most of them, it depends on your point of view. Then I said, I said before, an, another <coughs> big part is tracking information about your online behavior through different trackers. It's basically if they, they are covering like half, 50% of the web with these little minds that you are stepping on all the time. So they're getting all the time information about each website that you are visiting and so on and so on. And then they have also outside of Facebook, if there is outside of Facebook, so they can like, uh, 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 first, they own a lot of different companies. They have different services on other websites. So for example, you can comment on some other websites or so on and so on. You can, all of those little likes button and stuff like this. This is, for example, all the, some of the main companies that they own. But there is also different programs of like, uh, that they have uh, of like exchange of data with another uh, organizations through different kind of advertising, marketing means and, and whatever. So for example, this is all the mergers and acquisitions by Facebook that we map. Then we try to map different kind of Facebook partners. This is some kind of mostly data dealers or, or, or other marketing agency. Because the point is like they have they don't have everything, and they have this kind of hoarding uh, uh, behavior. Okay, m most of online businesses have this hoarding behavior of collecting everything. You know? They don't have all sets of data. For example, like there are some companies in, in um, mostly in US collecting a lot of other types of data. For example, data from your like when you are buying something, like financial data or like these affiliation cards. This is great, you know, this kind of discount coupons, but. So on, so on. So they like to exchange data with, with those companies. Even I really think they don't need because they have enough. And then on the right side of the map, you have different forms of targeting that they do. So as Chomsky is saying about traditional media, like for example, magazines. The, the, and you probably heard this like a million times, this, this idea of like the, the, you are the product. You know? But Chomsky is saying for magazine, it's like the, the, the product, it's not the, the magazine itself, but the audience who is reading the med magazine. Because the audience is being sold to the advertisers. This is what you are selling, the audience. But in case of magazines, the, the audience can be described in a in, in few different you know, categories. So for example, audience, audience of Mladina, you know, or audience of whatever other, uh, other magazine. But here, each individual user, this is something that's called nano-targeting, each individual user, it's a target group by itself. Because they're able to, to target 
so precisely on the nano level that that combination of different things like mom that have 35 years that is living in this part of the city and tra la 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 who likes to listen this kind of music. This is the new precision. Precision before was the audience of Mladina. So big difference. And so we were trying to map all of those different forms of targeting, so based on age, gender, location, languages. There is like targeting based on ethnic affinity. So it's not ethnicity, they said, it's like your ethnic affinity. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> or different life events. Or based, are you likely to engage in politics as a, con this is just for US, as a conservative, as a liberal, as a whatever different interests that you have, different behavior, what kind of device you use, and how you use that, what kind of network connection, how you're traveling, how often you're traveling. So our first idea was kind of really naive, that we will be able, like if we know all the input data here and all the output data <laughs> here, we will be able to somehow connect those dots. And that was like really crazy because you cannot. Uh, and then we had another idea that we should maybe run some tests to make some kind of, first we, we created, I don't know, like <clears throat> I think 20 or 25 different uh, um, fake accounts. And they were like sterile, you know. And then we were thinking if we, if we try to measure which behavior produce what kind of changes here, we will be able to do something. But it basically really, really uh, fast we, we understood that it's not possible. Because you, you never know, is, it some, is this, for example, news feed that I'm seeing now, or this ad that I'm seeing now, is this result of something that I visited two months ago, or it's something that I just visited yesterday, or it's based on our profile information, or it's based on I don't know what. And then we were saying, okay, this is like not working. And then we found uh, somewhere around like seven or, 9,000 different patents that were publicly available, and you can see some of them on that table over there. That were explaining some parts of this mosaic. And then we started to, to, to read those patents and try to find like different parts of this map and how all of this fit into one, one picture. So basically all information is collected through something that's called action logger, and then it's going into something that's called action store, and then there is something that's content store. This is how their databases are structured. You know? And then there is edge store. So what is really uh, important is that, so everything that appeared there, appear as a new node <coughs> in some network graph. It's called social graph. And then between those nodes, you have what they call edges. And edges are basically explaining relation between different nodes. So for example, one node is me as a an user, then another node, it's a, it's a picture that up, I up, uploaded. And then the relation, relation between me and this picture, it's, 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 for example, uploaded. And then somebody else can have a different interaction with, with, with this node. And then all of those nodes, millions and millions of nodes together, they are forming one really huge social graph that they are basically main core heart of this database. And this social graph basically visualizes and its structural relation between all the things that exist in Facebook. And, and then this, uh, there is something called user profile store and da, da, da. But then this social graph as a heart Around there, you have now different algorithms and different processes that are trying to, to extract meaning from there. So it's going on the both side. And, and what is like really interesting, it's kind of, uh, uh, 
it's totally algorithmic from the both side. So different algorithms, different mathematical functions, different neural networks are trying to understand the meaning of each word, each picture, each tag, everything. And on the other side, they're trying in the same way to understand each ad. And then in some kind of form of fuzzy matching, they are combining those two information and trying to give you ad or to serve you something on your newsfeed. And they're different. So extracting keywords, user topic extractors, and then each keyword have some kind of value that is related, related with you. And it's, it's really, really interesting. And then you have a different, hundreds and hundreds of different algorithms doing different things like social data recording, system, systems and methods for measuring user affinity in social network environment, system and methods for social mapping, determining influence in social networking system. This is like different patents or different algorithms that they have. And then what is really interesting is how they relate people between each other. So for example, if like two people are related to each other and they're like, for example, Democrats, they, and then one it's Republican, they are trying to understand what the third friend is based on like what kind of music plus connections, social connections. So it's like really some kind of social uh, mapping, but also events. It's not just, are you like clicking there and saying, uh, uh, that I, you are attending, for example, an event, it can also be like a measure that did you really attend? And then you are labeled as a liar. So everything it's measured, you know, it's not just, it's going deeper than, than your reactions. What I really like, it's routine estimation. And uh, so this is like, you know, you are, we are people of routines, you know, like we are waking up, almost every day in the same time, doing the same things, having some kind of patterns. And then they're trying to understand those patterns. Like are you, for example, you're logging in in the morning always in the same place. And then they're understanding this is home. And then you're going to a job. This is job. Then after the job, you're going to pick your kid. This is the kindergarten. And then trying to make like your routines and your patterns. And then when they understand your routines, they're able to understand your anomalies. What it means anomaly? Anomaly means that you are sick, or you are depressed, or you are traveling, or so on, so on. And those anomalies are basically saying to them different things. You know, because they are trying to understand to, to which social strata you belong. And it's not just like how much money you spend, it's also in play, part of the town you live. And what kind of music? So like, for example, like relation between, I don't know, hip hop and some neighborhood and some, I don't know what, means this person will not spend a lot, or so on, so on, so on. And when they understand that, they are able to put the price on you. Because if you are a spender, you worth more for them. So they are able to sell you better to people who are like, want to, 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 to give you, serve you ads then they're able to associate cameras with you. And so for example, if you give your camera to someone else, they know that. Because if this person posts on some other, because the, each picture, for example, have a metadata and then it's related to camera and then they're able to do a lot of crazy things. But in general, the idea is that we will be able to kind of like map how this system works. But in a way, it's one big lie and uh, so, for example, this map maybe is inter interpretation of something that was maybe existing in some moment. But because, for example, some of the patents are from 2007, some of 2014, some of 2015, or so on, so on. And it's kind of, you know, I like to think about this as some kind of exploring the, the, the wood with the lamp. You know, because you're able to just to find some little, you know, segment of thing and try to, to collect and create picture about that. But uh, it's like ancient man, map in, in which some parts of the, some continents doesn't exist. Or it's like Africa looks kind of 
funny or like, you know. But it's still the only thing that we have. We don't have any other map of, of such a complex algorithmic processes. And, and, and what I can really question is our, our capacity to, to, to do this kind of like algorithmic uh, 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 transparency at all. Because the time that we will spend to, to invest, uh, investigate all of these things, the system changed a billion times in between. So for example, if we spend like one year trying to understand this, the, it doesn't look like this anymore. So this is the picture from the past, or maybe from different past. So this is the problem with, 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 uh, with algorithmic transparency. Other interesting thing that more and more we were trying to understand all of this process, more and more we were sure that this idea of immaterial labor, it's even not working anymore. That we are not anymore uh, labor, because in this process you don't see us as, a, as a users. We are here just in the position of uh, a raw material resource, like a stone, or a, like a oil, or something like this. The real labor in this case is made by the algorithms. And lots of people will say, yes, but, but, but the algorithms are made by humans, or programmers, but those programmers really don't do the labor. They are just producing algorithms who are really doing the labor. So, a lot of interesting things to ask, and, and from the position of in, in independent investigator, this is really something that, that we, we are not, we really didn't solve this problem, how to do that. And the problem, it's, over, it's already obsolete. In a way, it's not trendy anymore, because algorithms were trendy last year. <laughs> this year, it's about artificial intelligence and machine learning, so nobody cares. <laughs> eh? And then a few years ago, you remember copyright, for example? <laughs> so, 2000. Oh. So, uh, we, tend, uh, we tend to jump from one hot topic to another hot topic, and to pretend that we sold something, but we didn't solve, solve anything. So, Problem and so because the, the the hot topic for this year it's about our, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, and machine learning <laughs> we have a map for that as well <laughs> so and this is the map behind you and uh, so it, it is okay there it's written anatomy of, of AI system because like I was doing this in cooperation with uh, one new institute on NYU called AI now. But basically, it's more about networks of metal, sweat, and neurons. And I was speaking before about networks, maps of internet service providers, and then maps of algorithmic processes, maps of uh, all of these kind of black boxes that are out there. And we were trying to map how the information is going from point A to point B, and who are the actors, and how these spaces looks like. But then in, in, in like spending a lot of time in with one really nice artist in, in Barcelona, Joanna Mo, I started completely to look from another angle on the problem. So if all of those that I was speaking until now, it's like horizontal level, this is the vertical level. So what is the vertical level? Each of those devices there, okay, that is on those network, have their own histories, okay? have their own materiality, have their own deep materiality. So I started to think about like birth, life, and death of all of those objects. So here on the left side you have a birth, then here in the middle you have a life, and then here on the right side you have a death. And it's like really, really, really hard at complex things. And then it started with starting with Earth, of course, and then there is like one really, really great uh, person called uh, Yusi Parika, who have a great book, it's called uh, Geology of Media. And he's speaking, you know, this idea of like, uh, you know, how media, it's extension of like, this McLuhan idea, how media, it's ext extension of human 
sensors and stuff like this. And UC Parika is speaking not about media as extension of human body, but media as extension of Earth. How all of those devices are coming from Earth, coming from metals, coming from different materials. And then I was trying to understand and trying to read a lot of things about that. And then you have like a lot of interesting story how in all of those devices, there are like a lot of different elements embedded. So for example, in one iPhone, you have three fourths of the periodic table of element in one single iPhone. It's not so different than, than one single server or whatever, it's almost there. And then when you are trying to understand, so what that means? That means that like, I don't know. Uh, so this is, for example, this is how many different elements we used in 20th century. This is how many different elements we, we used in 21st century. And most of this is coming after 80s, from the moment when we start expansion of, of, of electronics and, and this kind of stuff. And then the, the question is how all of these different elements are being extracted. And then you have an interesting story about rare earth elements. So this is uh, basically this part, I think, of the, no, that one, never mind. That part of periodic system of element. And then you see, for example, that like nine, around 90% of the, or 98%, it's, it's, it's mined in one single place in China. And, and a lot of strange story about how, how people are basically digging out those earths and how they are transporting them on different places. Then different angle that I had, it's something that you can read from uh, Christian Fuchs a lot about like digital labor. And something it's called Marx's dialectic of subject and object in economy. It, it's mostly about triangles. So, <laughs> and there is a lot of triangles on that map and you will see. So, so the, the story goes like you always have a means of production and then you have a labor and then you have a product. And this is this triangle. And then means of production, it's a tools and resources. And then all of those triangles idea is that this product of labor is becoming then a resource and then becoming a product and then becoming a resource. So for example, element is becoming a metal, metal it's then melted, transforming into something, coming into component, component assemble, so on, so on. This is those triangles. And then more and more I was doing this, I realized it's some kind of fractal chains of production that looks like, almost like, okay, I would like that they look like this, but they look almost like this. <laughs> so for example, if we are speaking about Amazon Echo, that this map it's about, so this big triangle is, is Jeff Bezos. You know? And then you have here, mines in I don't know where. And then if you, you can zoom out in and out and you will be able to explore different kind of uh, labor that is basically there. But what is like really interesting is that like this uh, extra value because from those triangles, the labor that this miner is doing, there is a extra labor that he's, the extra value that he's producing and then there is always someone who is extracting value from there. And you have this on each step. So you start from mine and then go to smelters and refiners. But what is also interesting, it's not just about exploitation of human labor, but it's also exploitation of earth. And it's something that is basically our common thing, no? How, you know, like now those guys have a right to dig there and this is our like metals, you know? And it's something that, that took like millions and millions of years to, to, to become element. Then I try to map all of these different environmental and, and working hazards. You know, elements are becoming metal and then becoming components. Then they're assembled there. And then you have a lot of different human stories. This is, for example, a story about Foxconn, about all of these crazy places in China those people who are basically living in factories. But really interesting thing is transportation. So for example, if we are going back on, on, on iPhone, for all the, all the components of our iPhone to arrive in Shenzhen to be assembled, they need to pass like two times to the, to the moon and back. This is how much they travel. This is how much 
those components are traveling all the time. And there is like extra cost for all of this, waste, environmental costs, and so on and so on. Because there is, there is kind of lots of different strange forms of labor there. So mix between, for example, human labor and, and, uh, and um, different kinds of like uh, robots and stuff like this. And then you have this story of, of, of for example, of Amazon, where this uh, uh, storage system have a humans attached to robots, basically. Because how they are sorting those uh, the products, it's not made for humans to understand because it's not like books are here, A, B, C, D, or like this kind of products are this part. It's completely random and it's not random, it's algorithmic. So humans are there just to follow some um, device who will say to them, go to place A, B and put your hand on the second shelf. But all of this is based in something that's called income inequality. So, up, chief executives, down, us. And it's this, this gap, it's really huge. So, for example, as a, as a professor in uh, Serbia, I am somewhere here. So, it's somewhere like software engineer of Infosys in India. Infosys is like those, like, 20, I think 20,000 programmers working in factory for coding. The first American salary is here, around 2,000 something. So you have North swiping on Tinder, left, right, and every move, when you swipe something there, it, it costs some labor. Even in energy, because like, each transmission of data over the internet spending some amount of energy that most of the time based on the call or on some other forms of labor that is out there. And then in the middle, I, I try to map how this process, when you say, for example, hello Alexa on this Amazon Alexa device, what's going on technically? And I will not go into details because I will let you to explore. But there are a lot of different, you know, from free material labor to different issues of rights to repair, open, open schematics, diagnostic tools, privacy, digital security, so five years ago, but still there. Never solved. Issues of internet service providers, NSA, everything, still there. And then new black boxes to explore, because like artificial intelligence with neural networks, Neural networks are by default black boxes that we understand what is going on in, but, and then we are seeing what's going on out, but we don't know why. And then new forms, new strange forms, like, because like how this process with artificial intelligence, now it's working, they need a lot of data, but this data need to be labeled. And then again, we have this kind of strange forms of labor, like, you know, user label, for example, when you are clicking, uh, this, is this a sign or a car? Car, you are training one, you are free labor for one, basically artificial intelligence. Or this is capture, or different forms. So for example, like really one of the favorite materials for, for learning uh, artificial, this uh, machine learning in this neural network is TED Talks, because there is like talks and it's labeled because a lot of volunteers, again, translated this talk and labeled what the person is saying. So basically all of those, some of those machine learning thingies are learned on tech, TED Talks. Okay. Others are, are learned on uh, Enron uh, email data set. So you just imagine what kind of bias this machine learning system will have if it's trained, if, if have like a kind of like background of Enron, man, Enron manager some, some kind of like ta, 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 and TED talk speaker, you know, like those are the, the things. So you have exploitation of human labor, you have exploitation of, uh, <clears throat> of, of uh, resor natural res resources, but you have also exploitation of data. And basically this hoarding a process of quantification of nature, because in the last hundred years, we tried to, to quantify everything you know, to put number on it. So you have like, related to humans, you have like a profiling, forensic, medi medical, 
uh, quantification, biometrics, psychological, behavioral, quantification of labor, how much you work, everything is quantified. And all of this is now becoming the food for artificial intelligence and neural networks. And the main point now, and one of the main problems now in, in this process is, is basically this, that, that for example, you will have artificial intelligence that is learned now because, because they, have, they need a lot of data sets, a lot of data. So who have data? Again, same companies, Facebook, Google, Microsoft. Now, this is why you are seeing now the, those same players developing artificial intelligence because they have access to data. But another problem that, that we have is that, that which, for example, you are speaking in Slovenian, we are speaking in Serbia, Serbo Croatian, Serbian, whoever, whatever, small languages. We don't have enough archive materials to feed those systems. So who have, again, the dominant power? English-speaking BBC archives. So all of those countries that have a history of archiving materials will be able to feed those neural networks. So that means that those ne neural networks will speak the language of the dominant cultures no? or dominant politics. So that means that in the same way as we have this income inequality gap here, the income inequality gap will be even higher because it will be somehow accelerated by all of those systems because they will promote and they will speak the language of the dom dominant cultures. So those are the, some of the problems that we wanted to map in, in this. Uh, uh, so on the right side, and I never have a time to speak about that, but it's a death. And it's like three-fourths of, of, of devices that we are disposing are still functioning. You know? But still, from this hard labor that we start until cognitive labor here, we are coming back to, again, hard labor here, how those devices are dying and how they are finishing in, again, developing countries and so on, so on, so on. But I think I, I speak enough for tonight. And <laughs> I will let you now to, to maybe enjoy the maps and try to find some interesting parts. And you have this, how do you say in English, these um, magnifiers, magnifiers, if it's too, too tiny. So thank you a lot. <laughs> questions? So if there is some questions or something, yeah.